Chapter 8, Holla and Basketball. Dear Deb Perlman at smittenkitchen.com, I have been thinking about God lately and what it means to live a life according to your convictions, as my grandma's pastor would say. I've never been good at the prayer thing. I mean, I pray sometimes, but only when something really, really bad is happening or I think might be about to happen. I don't think that's the same thing as just praying because you'd like to tell God about your day or you're just so happy or whatever. The thing is, I've been pretty worried lately and so has my whole family. And so I've been trying to get back to talking to God about all that stuff because maybe it might help somehow. And now I know you're wondering why. I would write to you about all this when you are a famous cook and this is about a Jewish recipe and my grandparents are Methodists, and I'm not even sure what my mom and I are. But I have a reason. It's this. I came across your holla bread on your blog, and you say even the smell of it could make a religious person out of you. And I like that. I like the idea that baking can be another way of talking to God. So maybe when I bake, it counts as praying, and God understands where I'm coming from. Anyway, all that to say... Thank you for this wonderful challah recipe, and my grandpa insists on calling it kala instead of challah. Everybody loved it, and it made our little kitchen smell as good and sweet as you promised. And you are right. It was even better the next day as French toast. A grateful fan, Ellie Cohen. I'm making more challah on Sunday afternoon after church, and a lunch of salmon patties and green beans. The kitchen is covered in flour, and so am I. But it's warm in here, and the windows are all fogged up and it's nice, like I'm snuggled in a sleeping bag. I need something to take my mind off school, and punching dough and braiding it like hair is exactly the thing to do it. I wish I could make bread instead of pie for the contest in May. Bread is trickier, like the final exam of baking. It would kick a lot of people out of the running. Wheeling myself all over school, plus doing the laps in gym, has made my arms feel like jelly. But I'm not telling mom because, miracle of miracles, she actually gave in and is letting me go without an aid. Rachel still waves from the office and tries to come over, but I shoot her off before her perfume gets me. At lunch on Friday, Coralie tried to explain the sixth grade groups to me, but she called them tribes, and at first I thought she meant Native American tribes. We are in Oklahoma, after all. But when I say totally innocent, like Cherokee, or she spit her coke out onto the table and laughed until Bert told her that you could rupture your spleen that way. No, Ellie, darling. She gets more Southern when she thinks she understands something you don't. I mean gangs, the kids who run together. She pointed at the end of our own row of tables, where a group of six boys sat with their heads together over a piece of paper. Those are the basketball players. They're probably talking strategy for the game tonight, she said, using our favorite air quotes. I could see their long legs sticking out at all angles from under the table. Yep, definitely basketball players. Who are they? I asked and nodded toward the three girls in the row next to us. It was the blonde one and her friend from my homeroom, who had laughed on that first day. They always wear shirts with words on them like love and 18R and short, short skirts with Ugg boots. It makes me cold just to look at them. Ick, yes. Those are student government girls. Wait, seriously, I said, because they did not look like the type to care about hall passes and the price of Cheetos in the vending machine. Seriously? They only do it so they can plan the dances. Coralie leaned over and pointed a french fry in their direction and it was so obvious that I grabbed her hand and pulled it down. What? They're too busy pretending not to watch the basketball guys to notice. That's C Sierra in the middle. She's on the beauty pageant circuit. She'll be at the one in Chill Coffee. I'm going to go in March. Wait, you're doing a beauty pageant? I couldn't make my voice normal, and Coralie noticed, because then she was pointing at me. Yes, I am doing a beauty pageant, and don't judge. How else am I going to get noticed? In case you didn't know, I'm not lined up to be on The Voice anytime soon. Besides, my talent is singing, and you know I will kick every girl's tail. She took a bite from her bologna sandwich and talked through it. 
I am going to be the next Casey Musgraves, so you better be nice to me. I snorted and stole one of her fries. I thought beauty pageants were for five-year-olds with crazy moms. Who are they? Bert asked, and I was glad because it made Coralie stop giving me the stink eye. I turned to where he was pointing just as obviously as Coralie. These two clearly hadn't spent a lifetime trying to blend in. In fact, more than the trailer thing might have been the reason we were the only ones at the table. The table Bert pointed at was on the only one besides ours where guys and girls sat together. I'm surprised you don't know, Coralie says. Those are your kind of people, Bertie. Those are the mathletes. They are the smarties, and they travel together doing math competitions and probably play chess in each other's townhomes on the weekends. I don't like math, Bert said, doing his slow blinking thing. I just like facts. I'm coming to learn that Bert isn't creepy weird like I thought. He's just a mega geek. If he lived back in Nashville, he'd probably have his own tribe of geeks just like him to calculate statistics and memorize all the former presidents of Lithuania. But in Ufala, he's just about the only one. We had all these cliques back at home too, but our middle school was 400 people. Now in Meemaw's kitchen, I think about how easy it was to get lost in the crowd back home as I pull the holla warm and golden out of the oven. Grandpa wonders in first. He taps his knuckles on the countertop. Mm-hmm. Something is calling my name. I slice us both a piece and top it with a little butter and honey. I hand him his wrapped in a paper towel, and he eats it leaning against the counter. He looks a lot younger today in his jeans and cowboy boots. Maybe he's just more rested. I haven't heard him up and about in the middle of the night in a while. And the bruise on his nose is mostly gone now. Mimo has told me more than once how they met. He was 19 and she was 15. And he rode up to her on a horse. Like he literally rode up to her on a black stallion and said, Would you do me the honor of a date? And it worked. He did rodeos back then. And she says he looked like a god or the devil. When he rode up to, dress, rode up to her dressed all in black from head to toe with his red hair shining. He took her to a fine I Italian dinner, as he would say. I bet they split spaghetti like in Lady of the Tramp. They got married when she turned 18, and that was that. I watched him now as he closes his eyes and chews slowly. Big girl, this might be the best thing you have ever made. We're going to have to hide this from the women, or there'll be none left by supper time. He winks and wanders out again. It's stuff like this that makes me glad we're here, even if Mom has to drive me to school and carry me into the bath, and the squirrels will not shut up at 6 o'clock in the morning. You are coming to this game whether you want to or not. I can't think of anything I'd rather do less than watch a bunch of dudes run up and down the court while I sit in my chair at the end of the stand like a grandma. I'm lying on Coralie's frilly white daybed and trying to stretch my toes. It's something Hutch has got me doing to help with the aches that keep me up at night. He might be the best PT I've ever had, but I'm not telling Mom, or she'll stop feeling sorry for me. Then I'd have to wave goodbye to the extra ten minutes sleep in the morning and half hour of screen, screen time at night. Nope. Cor Coralie throws a stuffed unicorn at me. You do not get to pull the cripple card. I am singing the national anthem in front of God in the entire middle school. And I want my best friend there to witness. That catches me off guard. I've never had a best friend. Ever. The closest I came was in kindergarten when a girl named Pammy decided we would be friends and pushed my chair around on the playground at recess. This is way better. I want to hit pause on life for just a minute and savor it. Like the most perfect first bite of pie. But Coralie's aiming a pill at me, so I say, okay, I'll come. But I'm bringing Bert. With all his brothers and sisters gone, I think he's lonely. Robots don't get to be lonely. Don't be like that. Like what? Like a townie. Ah, uh, I was just kidding, you know. I love that weirdo. The next night, I'm sandwiched between Mom and Bert and a crowd of people trying to file past concessions. I keep an eye out for elbows. I actually got a black eye once when we were waiting in line to see Santa at the mall. It's already 1,000 degrees in the gym, and even though middle school sports are like mommy and me playtime compared to high school, there's still a pretty good turnout. 
I spot Sierra and her clones in front of the front row taking selfies. Coralie's nowhere to be found. She'll be warming up, no doubt, Bert says, sounding suddenly British, which is what happens when he gets nervous. He's got on a Lakeview line sweatshirt, but there's a col collared Oxford underneath, and instead of sneakers, he's wearing loafers with actual pennies in the tops. I guess I should give him points for trying at least. You two want anything from the concessions, soda, a Snickers? I know my mom's only asking because she's looking for an excuse to get something herself. We hardly ever keep candy in the house. Payday if they have it, Bert says. Reese's for me, please. Bert, would you like an old people's candy bar, I tell him. Come on, let's get to the front. Coralie made me promise to take pictures. I let him steer me because it's just that crowded and we get right up next to the rail of the stands. I spot Hutch squatting in front of the team and their folding chairs on the sidelines. He sees me and waves, just as Mom gets back. I didn't know he was the basketball coach, too. So that's your gym teacher, who I'm, whom I spoke to on the phone, Mom says, and hands me a Sprite in my Reese's. It's already soft from the heat. Yeah, Hutch, Mr. Hutchinson. I watch her size him up like Meemaw does a melon that might possibly be rotten, and then the lights flash. And both teams stand, and Coralie walks out like a queen to the middle of the court. Her hair is bigger than I've ever seen it, like Lego hair, and she's wearing a red, white, and blue skirted leotard. Under the court lights, she sparkles like a firework. She takes the microphone from the ref like a pro, and leads towards the home fans as if she's about to tell them a secret. Evening. Pause. Y'all ready to salute our fine country? Pause. And then beat those badgers into submission? Everybody goes crazy, yelling and clapping and whistling or booing from the visitor stands. The ref shakes his head, but Coralie just winks at everybody and turns to face the flag. She takes two deep breaths like she's about to dive and then starts, Oh, say, can you see? It is low and strong and beautiful and I am only just realizing I have never heard her sing for real. Normally, she's just humming in the van or singing half lines in a room. When she hits, oh, the ramparts we watched, it's like she's another girl altogether, and I have no trouble believing she'll be famous. It's so powerful it shakes my heartbeat all up. Even Mom has her mouth open in a big silent O. Oh. I forgot to take my phone out for pictures until the end, when Bert grabs it and starts framing shots. When it's over and the applause dies down, she turns back to the crowd, takes a bow, and then says real low, Coralie out, and drops the mic. I whistle with two fingers like Mom taught me. Hutch laughs and bends over to pick up the mic and hand it to the ref. Back on the stands, Sierra is pursing her lips like she's sucking on a gobstopper. I hope singing isn't her talent for the beauty pageant. Actually... I kind of hope it was. That was amazing, Coralie, honey, Mom says when Coralie runs over to us with a towel slung across her shoulders. She's breathing like she just ran the mile in the gym. Thanks, Miss Cohen, she says, and then turns to me. Did you get pictures? Bert hands over my phone. That's the last I see of it for the rest of the night. She plants a big smacking kiss on his cheek that turns him bright red and I laugh into my sleeve. None of us watch the game, and the Lions lose by ten, but the night was a success. I don't even mind that not a single person spoke to me outside of Mom, Coralie, and Bert. Three is enough. Three is more than I've ever had before.